Hey guys, my name is Hiroko Murakami. I'm here with Knowledge Academics, and today we'll be covering topic B4 Thermodynamics Part 2. Now, before I get started, there is a small disclaimer to make here, which is that thermodynamics is a very, very complicated and very difficult topic. Uh, so if you don't understand after watching this video, then please don't feel discouraged. Rewatch the video a few times. Also, there's a supplemental video that I encourage to watch uh, by a famous uh, physicist YouTuber. Um, Hopefully those, these two videos will help you understand this concept and tackle it better in IB physics. So first we're gonna cover something called Carnot cycle. And Carnot cycle is the idealized heat engine cycle that maximizes efficiency. And to give a pretext into this uh, time period, right? The, the steam engine that was used on the trains were only about 3% efficient. And in cars nowadays, we have around 30% efficiency in internal combustion engines. So it's a very drastic improvement in efficiency. So when it was like 3%, they were all trying to figure out how to improve the cycle. So Sadi Carnot, this French physicist, was considering, okay, what's the idealized case? Even if it's unrealistic, let me consider the best case scenario. And if I'm able to approach that, then surely I'd be able to raise the efficiency of the train. Okay, and so that was his uh, thought process, and this is how what he yielded after three years of continuously working on this. And it starts from A to B, B to C, C to D, and D to A. So first it starts from A to B with a uh, isothermal expansion. So what it does is it's supplying heat, it's supplying Q, okay? It's supplying Q to the system and moving the piston, pushing it to let's say like midway here, okay? and it's doing it isotherm uh, isothermally. We've already talked about why isothermal processes are not practical in the real world, uh, because you, uh, it's practically impossible to expand the gas, to supply heat and expand the gas without changing the temperature of the gas particle. But remember, this is an idealized case, okay? So it expands isothermically to, let, let me call this position um, one, two, and three, three is the last part, okay? So it expands to two, okay? And now these gas particles, they still have momentum. So now I'm going to remove Q. I'm going to remove Q, the heat source. And it expands adiabatically. Remember that Q is zero, right? So Q is zero, which means that when it expands and does work, when it expands, that energy or loss of energy has to go somewhere. And that loss of energy is towards internal energy change. So temperature, is gonna go down. So now it's cold and it goes down until it reaches TC, the cold temperature, okay? And from here, we're at position three now, by the way. From here, we're gonna go CD. And in CD, we have isothermal compression. Uh, well, how do we compress it? Now, instead of putting that heat source, we're gonna put a really cold ice block, okay? Heat sink. It's gonna take away heat from the piston. So when it takes away heat, it's going to shrink, compress, because, well, the gas are going to shrink, right? So it's going to compress the piston and bring it up to two. And then they're going to do an adiabatic compression. So now they're going to remove the ice cube and let the compression continue until it heats up back to TH, okay? And this is called the Carnot cycle. And one of the reasons why it maximizes efficiency is because all of these four processes are completely reversible. Okay, another assumption we have is that there is no heat loss to the surrounding. So you know how there's like always friction between these places, there's friction between these joints, there's friction between gears, there's friction between gear and the pole here, right? All of these are zero, and so it's an idealized case, okay? And so now we're gonna talk about the efficiency. So efficiency of the Carnot cycle, let's analyze it. Well, first, we said that efficiency is equal to useful work over input work or input, you know, how much thermal energy we supply, right? So it's basically this. Now, in, the, in this diagram, it simplifies this whole process where you're putting Q and some of it is going to work while some of it is going to TC. It's going to a cold plate. And the reason why this is important is because the work, remember, is equal to QH minus QC. So you can see it here, QH is equal to W plus QC. Right? So this relationship is one of the most important ones. Okay, And so if we use this concept, then efficiency, which is this, is equal to QH minus QC over QH, which is 1 minus QC over QH. And by the way, QH and QC are proportional to TH and TC. 
So I can rewrite this as 1 minus Tc over Th. Okay, and remember Tc is how cold the ice, the heat sink is. Qh or Tc is, sorry, Th is how hot the plate is, right? So that's the heat source and the heat sink. And so we come to this uh, efficiency of 1 minus Tc over Th, okay? And so this is really important. And this, most of the time when we talk about Carnot cycle and how we use it in IV physics, how you're tested, is to know this basic concepts of Carnot cycle, like how they're all reversible processes, it's the maximum efficiency possible, all that stuff, as well as calculating the efficiency when you're given Tc and Th. And you can also interpret from the data as well, okay? So let's do a few practice problems to get you ready for a topic exam. Determine the theorem, pause the video and give this a try. A try. Okay, so we're saying that T hot is 100 and T cold is 20. Now there's one thing to keep in mind, which is that these are in Kelvin, okay? So the thermal, uh, the efficiency is equal to one minus by Tc over Th, which is equal to one minus by 273.15 plus 20 over 273.15 plus 100. Okay, so always keep this in mind. This is a very fairly common mistake that students make. Don't make this mistake. So if I put this in a calculator, I get 21.4%. Okay, and well, you, you're free to go and do B and C as well. Okay, so always remember to change it into Kelvin. So now I'm going to talk about heat pumps. Okay, and this is something you need to know conceptually speaking so you can explain it in paper two. So heat pumps, what are they? Well. They're just heat engines, but reverse. And they're used in things like fridge and AC where you want to cool something down, okay? So if you've ever wondered how a fridge works or how AC works, right? It's like, how do you cool something down, right? When the room temperature is higher than the fridge. So if the room temperature was colder than the fridge, then you can take the heat away from the fridge, right? Because heat always flows from hot to cold, right? This concept will never change. So how do you cool the fridge down? That's the real question. So let me explain to you this heat pump thermodynamic cycle for better understanding, okay? So first I'm going to label that this side is a fridge and this side is outside the fridge, okay? So this is the room temperature and this is inside the fridge. Now consider if the fridge is really you know warm, it's like 25 degrees right now. It, it doesn't matter what degrees, it's just continuously cooling it right now. So fridge is warm. This is where we wanna take the heat away from because when you take the heat away, it cools it down, okay? So first we use fluid and thermodynamics. The fluid inside is called Freon. You don't need to know this, it's just a special type of fluid that has a property that we're looking for where they're able to boil and uh, condense at the appropriate temperature that we're looking for, okay? So what happens? Well, if I want Q hot to flow and be taken away, I need this fluid to be, I need this fluid to be colder, okay? And when it's colder, it takes the heat away from the fridge. So the fluid heats up. The fluid heats up and evaporates. That's why it's called the evaporator. It evaporates and becomes gas, okay? And a low pressure gas. Now we're gonna actually compress it. And you're gonna see why this is important, but we're gonna compress it. And what the, the reason why we compress it is because when you compress a gas, what happens? It heats it up, right? So it becomes high temp gas. This is low T, low temp gas. So you actually just heated it up using a compressor, okay? Why do we do this? Well now, because this high temp gas is actually hotter than your room. It's hotter than your outside. So what happens when you expose those two together? Well, the temperature or the heat goes from gas to the outside. So heat escapes to the outside. Okay, and so what, that, what does that mean? Well, it's gonna condense the vapor because it's cooling it down. It's gonna condense it. So now it's a liquid, it's a high temp liquid. Okay, and then we go put it through an expansion valve, meaning the pressure is decreased. And so now you have a low pressure liquid uh, of Freon and it continues the cycle back. Uh, so just to reiterate what's going on, you have a liquid, Freon liquid that's cold it takes the heat away from the fridge and evaporates. Now it's vapor, low temperature vapor. Now it's compressed, becomes high temperature vapor. 
because compression leads to higher temperature. So now it's hot. So it's when you expose it to the outside, it's hotter than the outside. So heat flows from gas to the outside. Okay. And so now once you've taken the heat out, it condenses, becomes colder, goes to an expansion valve and repeats the process again and again and again. Okay. So that's how you actually make fridge colder. And that's also how AC works. For you to do that, you need to take heat away from the fridge to the outside using a medium like this. Okay, and this is a prime example of how a heat pump works. Do you need to know this? Not really, but it's nice that you know this because now you can tell the IB Proctor that heat pumps are essentially like heat engines. They work in thermodynamic cycles, but in the exact reverse, where they take the heat away and to the outside, okay? Now I'm going to talk about entropy. Okay, and entropy is a very misunderstood concept, but before I dive really deep into entropy, I want to talk about the Carnot efficiency again. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because this is probably the most common question that you'll be asked on the exam, which is, can we achieve 100% Carnot efficiency? And the answer is always no. And the reason why is because we have this efficiency that we here have here, right? Efficiency equal to 1 minus Tc over T hot. Okay, and the only way we can actually achieve 100% Carnot efficiency is to either have Tc as 0 Kelvin or T hot as infinity Kelvin. Okay, meaning you the, remember the heat source that I was touching it to expand it? I need that to be infinitely hot. Infinitely hot. Not possible, right? I also need the heat sink that I talked about, the ice cube that I talked about, to be 0 Kelvin. And the reason why it needs to be 0 Kelvin is because you have the gas molecules, right? If they have 0 Kelvin, what does that mean? That means they have no energy. And if they have no energy, meaning they're not moving, then they don't oppose the friction uh, compressing and coming back again and again. So what does that do? That means that all of the work is one way. It doesn't go the other way. There's no net work concept because there's only one way of work and the other one is zero. Okay. Now, another question that they will ask you is, aside from that, concept that we've talked about. Why can you never achieve high efficiency like the Carnot efficiency? And the reason why is because you always have inefficiency that leads to heat loss or energy dissipation. And we've talked about this briefly before, but it stems from like friction and sound and everything, right? We've always assumed in Carnot cycle that it's an insulated system where there's no heat loss, there's no sound, there's no nothing. That's just quite impossible. You'll have sound from grinding this, you'll have uh, uh, friction from grinding, you have friction from turning, right? You always have friction and heat loss and everything. So you always have energy dissipation, okay? And so it's not actually a reversible process. In reality, it's always, uh, it becomes a irreversible process where you'll have energy dissipation and wasted heat, okay? Now, entropy, I've talked, I've mentioned entropy, but entropy actually touches on this subject, which is why I'm bringing this up. Entropy is actually the measure of how spread out the energy is, okay? And the more you spread it out, the bigger the entropy, which is why in second law of thermal, okay, in second law of thermal, we always say the entropy of the universe always increases with every process, meaning the energy gets spread out more and more and more with every process. So going back to that example, when I do this process of going up and down, up and down, up and down, what's, what's going on? I'm converting some of that work into friction heat. So it's being dissipated into heat. Right? And this process is irreversible and this always happens. Right? So the, and that follows the concept of second law of thermal, where the entropy of the universe always increases with every process. Another way to think about this is like Sankey diagram. Remember, we talked about Sankey diagram extensively before. You'll have a fuel energy, right? And let's say this is a power plant, right? This, uh, some of that is converted into mechanical energy, which turns a turbine. Then that turbine generates electrical energy, but you're always going to have losses you're always going to have wasted heat, right? So with every process, you can see how spread out the energy gets. I started with just one fuel energy, a chemical energy. Now I'm having mechanical energy, heat, and I'm going to have like steam, I'm going to have uh, electrical energy, and it goes on and on and on, right? So it just spreads out with every single type of process. And that's what thermal, second law of thermodynamics really is about, okay? Another, pro another uh, example is soups heat dissipating into room. Right? When I have a really hot soup, what's going on? Well, the heat is dissipating into the room, meaning it's spreading its own energy out. Can we capture this energy and use it for something? Not really, right? And 
And also, one more thing is, when we talk about second law of thermal, we always say that energy dissipates. And the reason why we say this is because it doesn't go the other way. It doesn't concentrate. And you can see this here. Like, spontaneously, does the heat that's being dissipated go the other way? It doesn't go the other way. Heat doesn't go back to the other way into the, uh, into the soup, right? That's just not possible. So we always say that energy is always dissipated. Now, putting this in terms of energy is really, really hard to visualize for a lot of people. So they use math instead. And math sometimes simplifies things. And so they'll try to measure entropy in terms of mathematical, um, probabilistic math and statistics, and they'll use molecular disorder. Okay, and then so a simpler way to put entropy is a measure of molecular disorder. Molecules tend to become more disordered. As an example, if I have a room or two rooms, right, with all these particles, gas particles, the moment I lift it up, what's happening? It's going to go towards C where it spreads out. It spreads out and becomes more disordered. Okay, and because before I had very orderly, um, you know, one that's crowded and one that's empty. Now I have everything just disordered, okay? And so this is another way to look at entropy, which is the measure of molecular disorder. So the question becomes, how do we quantify entropy? And the way we quantify entropy is actually math using statistics, like I said, and it touches on the fact that you have possibilities available. So as an example here, right? Let's say I have letter A, B, C, and I have two rooms, okay? The way I can arrange these, all of the probabilities is, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight possible states for this, or eight possible probabilities for this to occur, okay? And so we call this the microstate. Now, looking at entropy in terms of molecular disorder and, you know, mathematical probability, etc., might be really useful for some cases and some scenarios, like for mathematicians, but for scientists and engineers, this is really impractical. And so we want to measure not really the, the entropy, the magnitude of the entropy, but we are interested in the change of energy. And so this equation gives us the exactly what we're looking for. So change in entropy is quantified as delta Q, the heat, over T. So try to use this equation to solve problems like this. So pause the video and give this one a try. Okay, so the entropy in this case is, well, delta Q over T. So the coffee is losing 5,000 joules, right? And the temperature of the coffee is 70 um, Celsius. Remember to always change it to Kelvin. So this becomes 5,000 divided by 70 plus 273.15. That's 14.57 joules per Kelvin. Okay, now this one assumption is that the, the temperature doesn't change. In practice, the coffee will cool down by about five degrees Celsius because it's losing 5,000 joules, okay? We're gonna end this video here. The part three of this series, the next video we're gonna be covering past paper problem and see what level you can expect for the IB to test you and better prepare for the exam, okay? So stay tuned for that. And also there's this one YouTube video that I'm going to link down below by a YouTuber called Veritasium. He uses all these animations and stuff to explain about entropy. It is not an IB specific video, but nevertheless, a very, very useful video in order to visualize what's going on, visualize a Carnot cycle, why that's not 100% um, efficient, and what the concept of entropy is. So if you're interested to learn deeper about the concept of entropy and get a full grasp of it, I really encourage you to check that video out. I'm gonna link it down below in the description, okay? Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this kind of video, then consider giving us a like and subscribing to our channel. We have a lot more lecture style video and content like this in our channel, so feel free to go check it out. Uh, if you're looking for additional guidance, like one-on-one -on -one tutors in IB subjects, SAT, TOK essay, IA's writing, etc., then uh, go to our website at novaedgeacademics.com, fill out the form, and we'll get in touch with us. In the meantime, we'll see you in the next video.